And I like this quote. Okay, this is kind of the issue with uh, public key cryptography. Three may keep a secret if two of them are dead, right? So the issue with symmetric ciphers is, right, you have a key that you share, right? Even if you share that key securely, you still have to rely on somebody else to protect that key, right? So there's two instead of just one. I would rather just have a key that just I need to protect, okay? Because I don't trust anybody. So that's the idea of public, that's one of the beauties of public key cryptography. You have a private key, you're the only one who is responsible for that private key. Nobody else has that, just you. It's one versus two, and it makes a big difference in a lot of applications. This should be review, you know, for everybody. I just want to make sure we're all, you know, sort of speaking the same language, refresh, you know, some of this stuff in your minds here. So go through this pretty quickly. That really the only thing we need in all this public key stuff is just some basic knowledge of modular arithmetic. Now I know they teach this in Math 42 or whatever it is. Is that it? Math 42. I don't know. Anyway, I talked to the instructor and I looked at the book. They do actually teach this stuff, but they kind of teach it at such a high level that people sometimes miss just the basic uh, manipulation sort of stuff, and that's really all we need. Okay, so um, modular arithmetic, you could think of it as, sometimes they describe it as clock arithmetic, right? You go around the clock, right? Um, the definition is, if you say x mod n, it means the remainder when you divide x by n, all right? What is the remainder? Well, another way you can think about that is just go around in a circle instead of on a number line. Okay, and you'll end up with the, with the remainder. So seven mod six is one, why? Because if you divide seven by six, you get a remainder of one. 33 mod five, you divide 33 by five, you get a remainder of three. Okay, and so on. So that's just the definition of mod. Now, important thing to realize, when we talk about something, say, mod six, the only answers you can get are zero through five, okay? Those are the only numbers that exist, right? Mod six, zero through five. So don't come up with 27. That's not a correct answer. It has to be zero through five. Um, okay, notation. So there's lots of different ways to, the point of this is if mod shows up anywhere in the equation, everything's taken mod whatever, okay? Everything's assumed to be taken mod whatever. So seven mod six, or we could write it this way with just putting them, sticking the mod here at the end. We could put parentheses around stuff if we want or not. Um, it doesn't matter. Just if the mod is in there, that's the way we take it. Now this is saying, this looks pretty innocent here. Um, all it's really saying is, when there's a mod anywhere in the equation, you can take the mod wherever you want, and as many times as you want. So you can take the mod of each of these guys before you add them up, and then take the mod of the result, or you could add them up first and then take the mod, and you'll get the same thing. It looks kind of redundant. Why would you want to do this? But we'll see, actually, for multiplication, this turns out to be kind of a crucial trick that makes things work a lot faster for RSA and public key systems in general. It's just doing this mod a lot more often. It turns out to be more efficient uh, programming ones. Okay, so you can take the mod of each individual guy, or you can multiply them first and then take the mod, or any combination thereof. So, okay, so things like this. We could add these two guys up, right? And we get eight mod six is two. Uh, two plus four, that's six, so that's zero mod six, because you get no remainder. Uh, okay, so something like this, right? So we can take seven plus 12, okay? You can add those two guys together first, and get 19, which is one mod six, or you can take each one individually, right? So seven mod six is one, 12 mod six is zero, add those two guys together, you get one. You have to get the same thing, whether you take them on first, second, third, in between, whatever, you get the same answer. Okay, so similarly for multiplication, uh, three times four, that's 12, so when you take that, and notice I put parentheses here, you can put the parentheses or not, it doesn't matter, it's still, in the equation is taken mod six, right? Don't think it means just this number or something, all right? It means it applies to the equation. Uh, okay, so three times four is 12, which it gives you a remainder of zero, uh, two times four, and so on. Okay, but this is kind of the interesting case, right? So we could take seven times four, first multiply it out, get 28, 
take that mod 6, you get 4, because you get a remainder of 4 when you divide. Or you could just take each term uh, mod 6 to begin with. So 7 mod 6 is 1, 4 mod 6 is 4, multiply it out, you get 4. Okay, so you have to get the same thing. All right. Uh, okay, now we need a, a little, a, a few slightly more fancy things, okay, for modular, but not much. Okay, now the additive inverse of a number. Okay, forget the mod stuff for a second. Okay, if I tell you the number 17, what's the additive inverse of 17? Negative 17. Negative 17. Why? Because the definition says <coughs> it's the number you add to 17 to get zero. zero. Okay, it's what do you add to 17 to get zero? That's easy, negative 17. Well, it's not quite so easy modular, <laughs> when you're doing modular arithmetic, but the definition is the same, okay? So if I say what's the additive inverse of x mod n, I'm going to denote it minus x mod n, but it means what number do you add to x to get 0 mod n. Now again, there's no such thing as minus 3 mod 6, right? It has to be 0 through 5. It has to be one of those choices. Right? So what is it? So okay, so minus 2 mod 6, I say that's 4. Why is that? Because what is saying, what is the additive inverse of 2? Mod 6. In other words, what do you add to 2 to get 0 mod 6? Okay, so you add 2 plus 4, you get 0 mod 6. Okay, or you could go to the clock, right? Go back to the clock, and you could go backwards to around the clock, and you'd get 4, right? Okay, so it really is saying the same sort of thing you see in the number line. Okay, the multiple. Yeah. Is it necessary for it to be less than 6? It can be 10 as well? Uh, when we talk about things mod 6, uh, we're only concerned with the numbers 0 through 5. Okay, so your answer should always be 0 through 5, something in that range. Okay. Got that? Uh, okay, how about multiplicative inverse? That's a little uh, less intuitive, I suppose. So, okay, so again, forgetting the mod stuff. Okay, if I ask you what's the multiplicative inverse of 17, what is it? One over, 17. One over 17, right? Because why? The definition says it's the number you multiply 17 by to get one. Okay, so the definition modular and modular is the same. So what do we multiply? And we use the same notation, x to the minus 1, to mean the multiplicative inverse of x mod n. It doesn't mean 1 over x. There's no such number, 1 over x mod n. Okay? There's only 0 through x minus 1. There's no fractions. Okay? But what it means is, what do I multiply x by to get 1 mod n? Okay, so what's the multiplicative inverse of 3 mod 7? Well, I say it's 5. Why is it 5? Because 3 times 5 is 15, which is? 1 mod 7. So if you multiply 5 times 3, you get 1 mod 7. Okay, that's what it's saying. Okay, so here's your quiz. Ready? Okay, what's uh, the additive inverse of 3 mod 6? 3, because 3 plus 3 is 0 mod 6. Good, pass that one. Okay. What is uh, the additive inverse of 1 mod 6? Five. five, because one plus five is zero minus six, or you could just go backwards one around the clock, right? Okay, good. Okay, what is the multiplicative inverse of five minus six? Should we vote? What is it? Can't be seven. There's only six choices. Zero through five. Do an exhaustive search. Try them all. What do you find? Five times five is twenty-five, which is one mod six. So five. Five is its own. Well, that's kind of weird, but it works and it fits the definition. Okay. What about this? What's uh, the multiplicative inverse of two mod six? Do an exhaustive search, right? Let's try. Zero, does zero work? No, zero is not. One, no, it doesn't work. Two, no. Three, no. Four, no. Five, no. Hey, we ran out of numbers. There isn't one. Okay, so there is no 
uh, multiplicative inverse. So that's kind of different, right? I mean, for regular arithmetic, there is a number that doesn't have a multiplicative inverse. What is it? Zero. zero. Okay, you can't put one over zero, right? It doesn't work. Okay, but here there are other numbers, okay, that have no multiplicative inverse. So that's kind of weird. Okay, so uh, we'll say that two numbers, okay, what does it mean for a number to be prime? We say a number is prime? It's divisible by itself. It's divisible by itself and one and nothing else. It has no other factors, okay, other than one in itself. Now we'll say that two numbers are relatively prime if they have no factors in common other than one. It doesn't mean, it could be that neither one itself is prime, right? but they just have no factors in common, okay, then we'll say they're relatively prime. Well, okay, that modular uh, that multiplicative inverse thing, it's uh, easy to tell when the multiplicative inverse exists because it only exists when x and y, x inverse mod y, it only exists if those two guys are relatively prime. Okay, so let's, let's go back here. So it did not exist in this case. Why is that? They're not relatively prime. What factor do they have in common? Two. two. Two and six have a factor of two in common. So you can just look at that and you'd say, oh, there's no multiplicative inverse there. Okay. Uh, we won't actually go through this. Uh, you know, there's an algorithm called the Euclidean algorithm, or actually extended Euclidean algorithm, I think. Uh, but uh, the point is, it's easy to tell when the multiplicative inverse exists. It's Computationally, it's easy to tell, and it's computationally easy to find the multiplicative inverse. If it exists, it's easy to find. We'll, we'll use that fact. We won't actually, I you know, won't require you to calculate multiplicative inverses you know, using the algorithm, but just know that it's easy. Okay. Uh, okay, finally, the last sort of, the one sort of com complex sort of number theory kind of thing that we need is the so called uh, totient function or Euler's totient function. Uh, B of n, and I just love to say this, okay, B of n is the number of numbers less than n that are relatively prime to n. Isn't that great? Well, let's just all say it together, it's so fun. The number of numbers less than n that are relatively prime to n. Okay, so it like counts, it's like a counting thing. It just <coughs> look at all the numbers less than n and count how many of them are relatively prime to n. And of course it means a positive integer. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Uh, B of 4. Okay, look at the numbers less than 4. So 3, 2, and 1. Okay, which of those are relatively prime to 4? 1 and 3. Okay, 2 has a common factor. So 1 and 3, so 2 of them. So that's why you get 2 there. Okay, there's two possibilities. Two, two numbers work. How about B of 5? 4, 3, 2, 1, they all work. They're all relatively prime. They all have no factor in common with 5. Why is that? 5 is prime. 5 is prime. You can't have a factor in common with 5 because 5 is prime. So that says if you have a prime number there, you're always going to get one less here. Okay, everything's going to work, right? Everything you try is going to work. All right. How about this, B of 12? Okay, well, let's look. 11, does that work? That works. How about uh, 10? No, it's got a common factor of 2. two. Okay, how about 9? No, it's got a factor of 3. How about 8? No, it doesn't work either. It's got a factor of 4. How about 7? That works. How about 6? No, how about uh, 5? Yes, how about 4? How about 3? How about 2? 1 always works. Okay, so 4. So it's sort of saying, you know, this number has a lot of factors, right? So you get a small number here. This number has like no factors, so you get a relatively big number here. Okay, got that? Okay, so this is the this is kind of uh, obvious from the definition. This thing about a prime here. This is not quite so obvious, but it's not really hard to show. You know, if we spent the time, we could easily convince you of this. If you have two primes, a product of two primes, p and q. B of that product is P minus 1, Q minus 1. Okay, so we will use this fact, okay? 